Hit me. Welcome to the Senior Rehab Podcast. The podcast for rehab clinicians that want to better serve older adults. Shorts. Shorts. This is Senior Rehab Shorts, the evidence-based segment for geriatric rehab clinicians, bringing you relevant and applicable content to better serve your patients, regardless of your setting. And now your host, Joe Daniels. Hello, friends, and welcome to the first evidence-based episode of this Senior Rehab Shorts series. Today's content is out of the Journal of Geriatric Physical Therapy, but specifically the July-September edition from 2011 by Tiffany Schubert. This is volume 34, number three. For those of you that are interested, I'll put a link in the show notes at the end. Um, But first, I'm going to briefly introduce some of the literature with regards to falls and the elderly, and then we'll talk a little bit more in depth about exercise prescription for the older adult, both in community-dwelling adults and for the frail and institutionalized populations that most of you are working with. So then we'll have the ability to draw some comparisons because there are some data sets that draw from one that link to the other. And so it's good to, to kind of carry those forward to, to look at them side by side. Just a little disclaimer that all material being used in these segments has been approved by the appropriate organizations, but in this case, the AGPT and the Journal of Geriatric Physical Therapy specifically. Uh, I'd also like to preface by saying that I'm, I'm still playing with some of the length of these episodes and that I may have to split some in two parts um, just because of the app that I'm using. So without further ado, let's get to it. Um, In terms of falls, they are clearly the the public health epidemic of this decade. Schubert notes that more than 30% of people aged 65 and older and more than 50% of people aged 80 and older will fall this year. And this was back in 2011, so clearly there's, there's probably been a rise in numbers since then. So falls are the leading cause of traumatic brain injury and fractures in older adults. For individuals aged 65 and older, falls outpace motor vehicle accidents as the leading cause of unintentional death by several thousands. So falls are also the leading cause of emergency departments by older adults and the number one cause of hospital admissions due to trauma. It's estimated the average cost of a hospital admission due to a fall is approximately $20,000. So by 2030, an estimated $54 billion will be spent on healthcare and direct and indirect medical costs due to falls. Now, in terms of best practice and what the evidence says with regards to how effective we can be with falls currently, the most effective research interventions report reductions of 35 to 40% in, in fall rates. It should be made clear that the term falls prevention refers to the optimal management of falls risk to prevent the falls that could have been prevented. So it's estimated that the maximum reduction in fall rates due to an intervention is approximately 30 to 40 percent. So a certain number of older adults will still fall regardless of interventions, but every effort must be made and taken to minimize this risk. So according to Schubert, the purpose of this integrative review article is is to present some of the most current evidence on effective fall prevention management for physical therapists and run through the screening process on what we need to be doing to be effective to recognize what deficits need to be addressed. So in terms of risk factors and screening, poor balance and difficulty in walking are common impairments that contribute to older adults' high risk of falling. The American Geriatric Society, or the AGS, published clinical guidelines in 2001, subsequently expanded and revised in 2011 that recommended all adults aged 65 and older, all adults be screened for falls. So if an older adult reports a fall in a previous year, a more in-depth evaluation is warranted and the appropriate interventions implemented to minimize risk of future falls will then be explored. So the extent to which physical therapists and other healthcare professionals have adopted these AGS recommended guidelines is not known at this time. However, a study of 2002 Medicare beneficiary data reported 22% of Medicare beneficiaries fell at least once each year. Now in 2011, this was 6 million people, almost 7 million people, and 10% or more falling multiple times, i.e. those with a history of recurrent falls, approximately 3 million people. 
So less than half of those who actually fell discuss this with their healthcare provider. So the AGS clinical guidelines were created to identify those with a history of recurrent falls deemed at higher risk of injury and hospitalization. So the results from this study, this study according to Schubert, suggest that healthcare providers had limited adoption of these guidelines. And so by not identifying high-risk individuals, an opportunity to implement appropriate interventions to mitigate the risk of future falls was missed, ultimately negatively impacting patient outcomes. Now, what the American Geriatric Society recommends is this comprehensive fall risk assessment. And, and it's a big, bulky thing that has a long list to get through. And I'll, I'll speak to some of the productivity requirements and the current constraints in, in what we're doing now um, as physical therapists and, and why this is difficult to implement. But what that f- comprehensive falls risk assessment looks like is obtaining a, a relevant history, a physical exam, a cognitive and functional assessment. So determining multifactorial falls risk would include the following. So a history of falls, a medication review, gait balance and mobility assessment, visual acuity, other neurological impairments, muscle strength, heart rate and rhythm, postural hypotension, feet and footwear screen, in addition to environmental hazard awareness. Um, So in terms of the current state of practice, that's what that's what that that AGS guidelines fall risk assessment would look like. Now, let's skip forward to the actual the purpose of this article in terms of exercise prescription for for the older adult here. And like I mentioned earlier, we're going to kind of split this thing into two parts. So it's going to be community dwelling and then um, the frail and the institutionalized. So we're going to look at dosage, mode of exercise, and then um, frequency uh, of exercise. So for community dwelling older adults, in terms of dosage, Sherrington's meta-analysis of 44 studies determined the minimum dosage of exercise to effectively reduce the risk of and rate of falls is approximately 50 hours, five zero hours. So the delivery of the dose of exercise was dependent on the trial with trials achieving the 50 hours over a period of three months, six months or longer. So interventions that achieve the minimum dose over six months or less may be slightly more effective than those that extend over a 12-month period for whatever reason. Um, And interventions that deliver a lower dose, a total dose of exercise, typically lasting less than 12 weeks, did not consistently reduce um, the rate or the risk of falling. So in addition, it appears individuals who start an exercise program to improve balance but do not achieve the minimum dose. And for the, for the um, community dwelling population, 12 weeks appears to be the magic number here um, may actually be at higher risk of falling, you know, if they start and they don't finish, because it may be that the gains achieved in strength and balance are enough to improve mobility, but not enough to achieve a protective effect. um, If the individual's resulting increased activity levels exceed his or her balance ability. So we're making them more mobile, but we're not necessarily addressing their balance deficits, and that's producing a negative outcome, uh, according to Schubert here. So achieving 50 hours of balance exercise within current physical therapy practice settings and funding models is extremely challenging, as we all know. Um, The use of validated home exercise programs for one of the published randomized control trials may be a strategy to achieve the 50-hour dose during a plan of care. The Otago exercise program, which a lot of us actually saw at CSM, uh, for example, demonstrated a 40% reduction in falls over over a one-year period for those in the intervention group. Now, 40 compared to the 30 or or, or 40 or 30 to 40% number we mentioned earlier is, is pretty significant. So the program, the Otago exercise program includes a brief series of full body warm-up exercises. And then here's the kicker, 17 I repeat 17 exercises that target leg strength, balance, and then walking performance. So apparently the program can be completed in 30 30 to 45 minutes and was originally designed for delivery in the home setting. The exercises are appropriate for individuals with high to moderate levels of functional limitations and impairments, but may not challenge individuals with lower levels of impairment and higher levels of overall function. 
So the take home with the community dwelling population for dosage is 12 weeks minimum. Um, in terms of mode of exercise, it appears that the mode of exercise selected will have the greatest impact on outcomes. And I want to repeat that because I think it's important. The mode of exercise selected will have the greatest impact on outcomes. So not frequency, not dosage, but what you're actually doing. So the Sherrington, the Sherrington meta-analysis reported moderate to high challenge balance training was the only mode of exercise that had a significant protective effect on the, res, on the rates of falls. So an estimated 25% reduction in fall rates um, with, with these specific balance exercises. Now, the other modes assessed included strength training, stretching, and walking as single interventions did not have a significant protective effect on the rates of falls. So this finding is consistent with a previous meta-analysis of eight trials that reported individuals participating in exercise programs that included balance exercises had a pooled estimated 17% lower falls risk compared with interventions with other forms of exercise, i.e. strengthening, stretching, etc. So on the basis of this information, Balance training appears to be the, or one of the most effective interventions to improve balance and prevent falls. Um, and it may include static and dynamic activities and functional activities, um, like, like gait training, dual task, reaching, turning, whatever it may be. Um, but the most effective activities are performed while standing with minimal upper extremity support and designed to be progressively more challenging. So in addition to balance exercise, researchers have assessed the effect of training program specific or training specific systems to improve balance uh, through perturbation training, etc. So these interventions have demonstrated that different aspects of balance can be improved, but that additional research needs to be done to determine if training a specific balance system transfers to uh, to fewer fall rates. And in terms of mode, uh, with the community dwelling population, several things in this article are mentioned. They mentioned static, dynamic activities, uh, dual tasks, strength training, and walking. So I'll briefly go through that stuff, and then we'll address what, what you all are here for. It's the actual frail and institutionalized population that, that you can take this, this data to and actually apply some. So in terms of the community dwelling, um, static activities are obviously those that challenge the center of mass. While the feet remain fixed and exercises that practice a narrow base of support, so tandem series, the single leg stance, um, have been included in effective interventions. So the stuff that I'm mentioning, guys, is stuff that's being proven to be effective in the research. And I know you guys are doing this, but I'm going to repeat it because it's it's what's what's proven time and time again to be effective. So in terms of static, what I just mentioned, dynamic activities, um, activities that challenge the center of mass while the feet are in motion are dynamic activities. So these tend to be functional and may include reaching, turning in a circle, standing, and stair-stepping. Um, as far as dynamic gait training, this can be incorporated into progression of intervention using dance steps, circling, figure eights, directional challenge, or changes on command, um, an obstacle course, or even just dual task training. So in terms of dual task training specifically, Older adults who have significant difficulty performing walking and talking tasks are at a, at a higher risk of falling. And that makes sense. Um, so dual tasks for balance training interventions can include anything from having a conversation while, while walking, changing the walking speed, um, walking and counting, or walking while performing a manual task, such as carrying a full cup of liquid or multiple objects or simulated laundry, for example. Um, as far as strength training, cue Dustin Jones refer back to the to the CSM lecture um, but specifically in this article for community dwellers and strength training um, Schubert mentions that strength is a key element of fall prevention however strength training alone without a balance component is not an effective strategy to prevent falls so a recent meta-analysis identified the key components of strength training that translate to improve balance and reduce fall risk included a focus on lower extremity and postural muscles minimal upper extremity support and that was delivered at either a moderate or high intensity to achieve the desired results. Now, in terms of walking, walking as an exercise obviously should not be included in the beginning of a fall prevention program for, for obvious reasons, um, when the focus needs to be on, on strength and balance. Now, the Otego exercise program provides an excellent example of how and when 
walking should be incorporated into a balance program. Individuals begin with home-based strength and balance exercises, and then typically after four weeks or so, we're instructed to include three 30-minute walking sessions a week into their exercise routine. And then last um, but not least here is the perturbation and compensatory stepping training. Uh, individuals who completed a 30-minute perturbation-based balance training program three times a week for six weeks took fewer multi-step Yep, multi-step reactions and had fewer foot collisions when the base of support was changed uh, compared to controls in a flexibility and and relaxation group. And this is, again, uh, in community dwelling populations. And then last but not least with the the community dwellers, it's with regards to frequency and duration. So the one finding that was consistent across studies was that interventions had established and followed a standardized routine, right? So same components each time you have a warm up, balance, strength, and then a systematic progression of the difficulty of those exercises within same session and multiple sessions. So the individual is challenged uh, within that in- intervention period, you know, because basically the goal is if, or the thought process rather is that if we're not being challenged, then we're not growing. And that's the whole concept of the seated therax for those who can walk and, and do squats or whatever. Um, so that's, that's it in terms of a, a, a fairly concise little summary of the community dwelling exercise prescription, um, frequency duration mode, etc. there. Now, in terms of the exercise prescription for the frail and institutionalized older adult, Here's what I have. So we're going to look at dose, we're going to look at mode, and we're going to look at frequency and duration of exercise. So Schubert mentions that exercise to improve balance must be part of a multifactorial intervention assessing all risk factors in frail older adults. So individuals in skilled nursing facilities have the same risk factors as community dwellers. However, the risk factors of incontinence, stroke, dementia, depression, and the use of sedating medications are far more prevalent. So fall preventions or fall prevention interventions that were either solely exercise based or physical therapy based either had no significant protective effects or actually resulted in an increase in falls. So the greater number of comorbidities and the complexity involved in patient care provides insight. Your real intervention may not be effective at this time. So when exercise is included as part of a multifactorial intervention, the guidelines are similar to those for community dwelling older adults. So the intervention should focus primarily on balance and balance challenge exercises. So the exercises should be done while standing and should be progressed over a period of time. So exercise interventions to improve balance and strength have been demonstrated as feasible and safe in both frail older adults and those with significant cognitive impairments. So here we go with the dosage. Um, The minimum dose of exercise for frail and institutionalized has not yet been officially determined. Um, It does appear that exercise interventions may have a greater impact on outcomes for this population over a shorter period of time, but this may be due to the the greater number of impairments at baseline compared to community dwellers, and that makes sense as well. You know, although there's no official guidelines yet, interventions that have demonstrated significant improvements in functional measures have been a minimum of eight weeks and a maximum of one year. So in terms of dosage, guys, with balance and falls, a minimum of eight weeks is what it really takes to reduce any kind of fall risk. And that's something that needs to be in documentation to justify your plan of care and your length, etc., uh, shorter interventions, eight weeks or less with fewer frequencies twice a week or less. So back to frequency, at least three times a week for eight weeks is the minimum number. Do not, and so with fewer, with fewer frequencies twice a week or less, do not consistently demonstrate significant changes in outcome measures. Now, in terms of mode of exercise, again, um, not very specific to this population, but effective exercise interventions to improve balance and strength are obviously those that incorporate functional balance training, high intensity strength training, and gait training. So even supervised power training, again, Q. Dustin Jones, has proven to be safe and effective with this, popula- with this population. I think kettlebells are a great example um, in this population. So, so Q to Dustin for that one. Um, perturbation training in conjunction with gait training and balance training appears to be an effective way to decrease the risk of falls, but may not have a significant impact on risk factors. But again, guys, we're not really going to change those, those risk factors. We're, we're addressing the deficits specific to balance here. 
Now, last but not least, uh, with this population, frequency and duration. So again, not known officially at this time, but common themes in the research did include consistency. So attending a session or, or a visit a certain amount of times per week, you know, in this case, it would be at least three times, a structured progression and a program tailored to the needs of the individual and progressed appropriately. So something that is salient to the patient and something that is going to work toward their goals that's specific. You know, we're not talking about seated kicks or seated therax here. Um, obviously, those those are appropriate for some populations, but in this case, uh, not so much. So for example, if an individual with a significant functional impairment may benefit or I'll rephrase that for an example, for example, an individual with significant functional impairments may benefit more from a functional exercise program. Whereas someone with a significant cognitive impairment, for example, will benefit from a structured exercise program in which the same exercises are done the same way every time. And and that's, that's the key take home there. So in conclusion, the research supports the most effective interventions to manage fall risks are those that incorporate exercise, obviously. So for optimal results, the exercise program needs to be structured, progressed, and must achieve the minimum dose of exercise, which in these folks, our folks, is eight weeks. So the information presented in this article obviously has several implications to clinical practice. So first of all, exercise intervention should be structured, right? So we need to strive for a greater consistency between treatment sessions or ensure that the patient is doing a regimented home exercise program faithfully. And that's, and that's specific to your, your home health folks there. Um, the home exercise program should be structured, progressive, and incorporate center of mass, narrow base of support, and minimal upper extremity assistment, assistance, according to Schubert here. Exercises should be become more challenging, progressing from two hand to one hand to no hands, etc., and to challenge the patient's skills. And then once mastered, exercises can be varied for an even greater challenge. Second, fall prevention intervention should be individually tailored to challenge the patient on the basis of level of his or her impairments. So therapists need to coordinate with other healthcare professionals to ensure that all risk factors are addressed. And then exercises should be prescribe that challenge balance based on risk factors and impairment level. Third, interventions must achieve the optimal dose. So at least eight weeks for frequency, three times a week. Now in terms of dosage, you know, we mentioned moderate to high levels of, of balance challenge. So one of the greatest challenges of fall prevention is the duration of intervention necessary to achieve these outcomes. The exercises can be delivered in the clinic, in the home, or in group exercise classes. But the most important thing, and this is common sense, is that the exercises are actually done by the patient. So researchers, um, again, see, see the citations for references, um, have reported that effective programs have been delivered either by a physical therapist or an individual trained and supervised by a physical therapist. So clearly, guys, we're, we're the most appropriate medical professional to be addressing this issue. And so we need to, to prove our value here and to continue to use the evidence and use these outcome tools to better our outcomes um, so we can sell to the public and, and get everyone to realize that we are the best entry-level professional to see to prevent fall risk. Now, Effective fall management clearly requires a paradigm shift in how physical therapists provide care. And in this, in this paper, there's a great figure that really takes you through the continuum of, of entry, you know, evaluation to the full screen and then what your options are in terms of interventions and, and what that translate to, translates to in terms of outcomes. So consider an older adult referred to physical therapy with a medical diagnosis of adhesive capsulitis. So during the initial evaluation, the therapist administers a fall screen and discovers the capsulitis is due to a shoulder injury that incurred when the patient fell at home. So the therapist then performs a timed up and go test and the patient has difficulty rising from a chair and performs a task in 15 seconds, say. Now we all know, according roughly to the evidence, that 11 to 12 seconds is your cutoff score for falls. So in addition to assessing the shoulder joint, the therapist will ideally institute a comprehensive falls risk assessment 
When the medication screen identifies the patient has taken eight medications, and three of which can affect the reaction time and increase risk of falls, the therapist contacts the physician with a request for a new diagnosis of balance impairment and clearance for participation in physical therapy based on a medication review. So the shoulder injury and the falls risk become the focus of the episode of care and clinical goals are, are expanded to include falls prevention. Schubert goes on to say that there will be a finite goal of improving the shoulder function and a longer term goal of falls risk management, which, which makes sense. So the therapist will improve the individual's balance and functional mobility to the point of safe participation in an evidence-based program where these improvements can be further progressed and sustained. So the patient will ultimately be discharged to a maintenance program when the dose of balance training has been achieved. So this change in, in, in paradigm dictates that physical therapy shift from more episodic care, i.e., you know, treat the diagnosis, progress to a functional level, and then discharge to an independent self-directed program to more of a continuum of care where patients are progressed to meet their functional goals, transition to an in-house or community bridge program, and then discharge to a fitness or home exercise program while the individual is in a transition, he or she would remain in contact with the therapist to continue progress. So the therapist may not formally discharge the patient until independence is achieved within the appropriate exercise program. So by extending beyond the traditional therapy model, the optimal dose of exercise is achieved, right? So there's a greater potential for patients to maintain this progress, continue to improve on their abilities, and then sustain meaningful and permanent changes in risk factors and ultimately reduce the falls risk. So, you know, in a nutshell, that's, that's it with this paper. Um, so in terms of dosage, specifically at least eight weeks, uh, frequency rather, eight weeks, three times a week at the very minimum, you know, and, and if you start an exercise program, and don't finish, there may be an increased risk of falls because you increase their mobility, but not necessarily their balance, meaning they may be at an, an increased risk for falls at that point. Um, so make sure you follow through with the full program. And then last but not least is obviously switching from episodic to the continuum of care. And this is going to take some time in our field. Um, however, I think that that is the ultimate goal at this point. So if any of you have any questions, feel free, as always, to, to reach out to me, Facebook, Twitter, um, my cell phone, 217-714-4673. Um, and until next time, stay funky, my friends. Hit me. Thank you for listening to the Senior Rehab Podcast. If you enjoyed this episode, you should hop on over to SeniorRehabProject.com to find more helpful content. You can also find out how you can join the team and be a part of the private Facebook group, the monthly mastermind meetup, and have a say in the content and direction of this podcast. Once again, that's SeniorRehabProject.com. I appreciate you, and I'll talk with you soon. But in the meantime, do not forget to stay funky.